it's time for a short and scary history lesson. I want to fill you in on the twisted story behind the troubled teen industry. Some are asking, what is the troubled teen industry? The troubled teen industry is a vast and highly profitable network of programs and facilities that advertise treating, rehabilitating, or reforming troubled youth. There are hundreds of these in the United States, ranging from wilderness programs, behavior modification programs, boot camps, therapeutic boarding schools, religious programs, rehabs, and more. They take kids with problems ranging from serious psychiatric disorders, drug abuse, trauma issues, to kids who have difficult family relationships or just aren't performing to their parents' preferences. They even take LGBT kids simply for being LGBT. And with around 50,000 children being kept in this industry every year, chances are high that you know someone who has been in it. The problem isn't about kids needing treatment. It's that much of the industry claiming to treat them is barely overseen, under-regulated, and riddled with abuse. These children are dollar signs, and it's big money. And as we all know, big money brings big corruption. So on to the history. How did this mess get started? With a cult. That's right, a cult. Don't give up on me here, it's about to get interesting. In the late 50s and early 60s, a recovery group called Synanon formed as an offshoot of the 12-step program Alcoholics Anonymous. Synanon centered around a therapy attempt they dubbed The Game, in which members would gather and hone in on each individual member to berate, humiliate, and pick the person apart until they were humbled enough to grow. The group exploded in membership and rose in popularity to the point that they had a prominent building on the beach in Santa Monica, California, and even California courts would issue requirements to juvenile drug offenders to attend. Synanon quickly evolved into what has been called one of the most dangerous and violent cults in American history. Members had to shave their heads, couples were split and required to recouple with new partners, there were forced sterilizations and forced abortions, and the game, as they called it, was a furious, violent, and brutal attack therapy event that all members had to participate in. Many were hospitalized with injuries from these beatings, and members were afraid to leave under threat of worse violence. LAPD got involved, the leadership of Synanon collapsed, and the cult slowly disbanded. But not before those inspired by Synanon's tactics went on to start their own programs. Art Barker started a program called The Seed in 1974. Soon to follow was Straight Inc. and Sidhu Schools. A former Synanon member, Mel Wasserman, founded Sidhu Schools, the beginning of therapeutic boarding schools, and would take children with behavioral or substance abuse issues and apply the same concepts used in Synanon to fix them. Despite scrutiny and claims that the brainwashing methods used on individuals in these programs were a violation of their right to freedom, nothing was done to end the practice. One could say part of the reason for this was the close political ties held by those who profited from the programs. For example, Joseph Zeppala and Mel Sembler, the founders of Straight Inc., co-chaired in raising $25 million for the Bush campaign and would later be given ambassadorships to Spain and Australia. Both were major donors to the Republican Party. The connections continue, but that's a story for another time. Through brainwashing, coercion, and more attack therapy, programs like Straight Inc. were a disaster for vulnerable kids, and the programs that evolved from there were just as bad, in some cases, much worse. Thus began a wave of what can be called the tough love approach to treating troubled kids. More and more facilities began to open their doors, advertising their ability to fix and reform wayward youth. As the war on drugs and paranoia about teen delinquency rose up during the Reagan administration, parents were gripped with fears about their, in many cases, normal teenagers. And there, conveniently, were now a myriad of troubled teen programs ready to relieve these parents of their worries and promising to put their kids on the right path. Even Nancy Reagan herself would sing the praises of programs like Straight Inc. and the need for tough love on delinquent kids. Straight Inc. would later be shut down for their unusual punishments and abuses. But the seed had been sown, and the troubled teen industry grew strong roots with facilities and programs everywhere by the 1990s. It remains, somehow, a secret American staple. Programs have opened and closed all over. At times, there were facilities where kids were kept in dog kennels, severely beaten and subjected to an unending list of inhumane treatment like being forced to eat their own vomit. As the worst programs were shut down, the ownership would often simply rebrand and open again in a new location. This still happens. Indeed, some of the same people who profited from this industry in the 1970s are still profiting from it today. While some reform has happened since the worst years, kids are still being abused in this industry every day. Programs have been known to use isolation to punish and break children. Restraint is misused and can cause severe injury or death. Kids are over-medicated or sedated for convenience, and because it's cheaper to hire underqualified and poorly trained staff, 
physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect are far too common. At the core of it all are dangerous pseudotherapies with no scientific proof of long-term effectiveness, which at best help a few, and at worst damage the mind of a child for life. And the kids, if they dare to speak out, are easily shut down. Because after all, who believes the troubled child over a professional adult? To those who research this industry, it becomes quickly clear that the abuse hasn't truly gotten better. Rather, the most successful and profitable facilities have gotten much better at hiding it. But we know, and now you know, and that's our greatest weapon for change.